Amen. Where he leads me, I will follow is what they were playing. Thank you, ladies, for the music. And our first hymn tonight is 288, Hallelujah, We Shall Rise. And it's going to be a glorious day. And the Lord comes, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Would you stand together? Steve will come. And lead us as we sing, Hallelujah, We Shall Rise. Ah, this is a good quartet number, actually. And when we get to the, the chorus, the men, we shall rise, they sing that, okay? All right, here we go. In the resurrection morning, ere the trumps ever sound, we shall rise, we shall rise. And the saints shall come rejoicing, and no tears will ever flow. We rise, we shall rise, we shall rise, we shall rise. The resurrection morn, when death's prison broken, we shall rise, we shall rise. In the resurrection morn. What a morning it will be. We shall rise, we shall rise. And the saint will come rejoicing, tears of the We shall rise, we will rise, we shall rise. Rise in the resurrection morning when death's risen. the last. In the resurrection morning we shall meet him in the air. We shall rise, we shall rise, and be carried up to glory to our home to the fair. We shall rise. Come on then. We shall rise, we shall rise. Remain standing as we pray. Our Father, we thank you for the resurrection of Christ, that he arose from the dead on that third day, having paid the penalty for sin and purchased our salvation. We are so grateful. So we come tonight to give you thanks, to give you praise, fellowship one with another. We thank you for the body of Christ and for the edification uh, that is done by each one to encourage and minister to strengthen one another in the faith. Father, we look forward to that day when we shall rise and you will come again and take us to be with you for all eternity. What a glorious plan you have prepared for us, those who know you. Father, we ask your blessings on our study tonight as we look into 1 Samuel. We ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us into the truth of the scriptures and that we would learn more of you as well. And Father, we continue to pray for those who cannot be with us, those who are sick, uh, those who are traveling. We ask that you would meet uh, their needs. Thank you again for uh, this coming week, this being the first day of a new week that you've given to us. Help us to take advantage of opportunities we have uh, to witness, uh, to minister, to serve. Uh, to help one another, and we just thank you for the strength that you give us each day. We especially pray as we see forecasts for this week for extreme heat, that you would uh, keep folks safe that uh, need to be outside, and you'd watch over them as well. We thank you for the air conditioning we have tonight where we can gather here uh, in a cooler place to worship you, and we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated for our next song. 386, here am I, Lord.
Kevin Barber, if you'll ask God's blessings on our gifts as we have opportunity to give back to the Lord. And as we're studying Samuel, we remember that was what Samuel said to the Lord, here am I, and uh, made himself available, and may the Lord do that with us as well. Kevin? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you that we can set it apart to worship you. Lord, you deserve all the honor and glory. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be prepared even this evening for the message that you have for us. May uh, any unconfessed sin in our hearts be brought before you. And Lord, we know that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for the opportunity to give. And may this be used to send the gospel not only here in Sumter, but all around the world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And the words to Kelly's song will be on the screen behind us. Hit number 302, we just stand and sing, Jesus led me all the way. Yeah. 
He is Lord. He is Lord. He, he, he is Lord. He is Lord. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do it. I can read music and he translates it. I'm gonna, so we're going to do it in the kid thing. He, he is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And God's people say, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Steve. Turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, remember in the Old Testament, God had sent judges to deliver Israel and then they would go back in their sin and he would send another judge and uh, and after the period of the judges we come uh, to the beginning of the kingdom stage uh, where the first king was anointed that of course is Saul and as we get to the end uh, of the message we'll see Saul anointed as king and as we go through this uh, tonight uh, I usually give you a preview of my uh, main points, and there are 10 of them, so we'll not uh, preview those 10 points uh, tonight. But the first one is Samuel's sons, and the second one is a system of government, and we'll go through and look at those. Let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Father, thank you that you indeed are Lord. Uh, you're Lord of all. Help us that we might be subservient to your Lordship, that we would surrender uh, to your will and put our will uh, aside so that you can rule uh, in each of our hearts and then use us for the furtherance of your kingdom. Guide us into the study of your word tonight. Thank you for the prophet Samuel and for his willingness to be used of you and for his parents. And Lord, there's so much we learn for this and we pray that you would open our hearts to receive what you have for us tonight. In Christ's name, amen. As we look at his sons in chapter 8 verses 1 through 3 it says it came to pass when Samuel was old he made his sons judges over Israel now the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abiah and they were judges in Beersheba and his sons walked not in his ways but they turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment and so the first thing we see about his sons uh, was their way uh, they went their own way and you hear that, you know, do your own thing slogan. 
Well, that's not new. Uh, it's here with Samuel's sons. They decided to go their own way, do their own thing, and not walk in the ways of Samuel. But then we also see uh, their wealth. They got it from uh, taking bribes, it says uh, here. And, and so the Bible does teach us that uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, and so here uh, they had a love of money uh, and they began to bribe people because they wanted more of it and it was certainly to their downfall and to the nation uh, as well. But then we see their wisdom. Uh, we were talking not long ago, especially in the book of James, when we were comparing the world's wisdom to uh, heavenly wisdom there and they had some wisdom but their wisdom was of the world and they perverted uh, judgment. This word perverted is a Hebrew word that means to stretch out. Uh, and so we have a phrase that we use sometimes called stretching the truth. Uh, and stretching the truth is really a nice way of saying he's lying uh, there. And, and people like to put nicer names to their sins, what they're doing. And, and so that's what they were doing. They were stretching the truth. They were perverting judgment. And we saw this morning from 1 Corinthians that God commands us as believers to judge, to be discriminatory uh, in the way people are living and judge it based upon the Word of God. But they weren't doing that there. And, and so they were perverting the truth there. And here they were being appointed uh, as uh, judges uh, over Israel and leading people astray. And then God decided to set up a system of judgment, of government. He had done that uh, before creation, of course. Verse 4 says, And all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and they came to Samuel, and they said, Samuel, you're old. And that must have been encouraging. He probably knew that already. Verse 5, he said, Thou art old. And your sons, they're not walking in your ways. So make us a king to judge over us like all the other nations. And so they come to Samuel and they want a king. They look around and all the other nations have a king. And the king goes out and fights their battles and all of that. And they said, we want to be like the other nations. They were tired of the system of judges. They were tired of what God had given to them. And they wanted something different. Uh, there. And sometimes people today get tired of the old traditional things and they want something new there and so they might try it in a new kind of worship, new kind of music, want something new. They're tired of what God has given to them and they leave the old ancient landmark as the scripture says. And so here the people, they're tired of that. Uh, but the problem was not the system of the judges. The problem was their sin because God's plans are good uh, if we follow them. So we see that their request was to have a king and, and we see their reasoning. The reason they wanted a king uh, was because everybody else had one. That's not new either, is it? Uh, you know, and, uh, and so God wanted Israel, like the church, two separate entities there, but to be a peculiar people set apart for him. They didn't want that. They wanted to be like everybody else. And too often today we have those who are called a brother, as we saw this morning from 1 Corinthians. They want to be like everybody else. They want to live like the world. They don't want to come out and be separated unto the Lord. So they said, Samuel, give us a king so that we can be like everyone else. Well, Samuel wasn't pleased with that. So we begin reading in verse 6. And the thing displeased Samuel. So what do you do? And Samuel being a godly man, and something happens or people say something to you like they did to Samuel, and you're not pleased with it. Well, look what Samuel did. The thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And here's the connection, the coordinating conjunction. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And what a wonderful response when things don't go the way we want them to go. He goes to the Lord and he prays because he was displeased with that. And in our lives, whatever displeases God 
should displease us. And that was one of the problems in the Corinthian church we saw this morning. Uh, the sin that was there was displeasing to God, but they weren't having any sorrow over the sin that was there. So here Samuel hears the people wanting a king to be like the other nations there. And so he goes to God and then he prayed to God. And God provided an answer for him. And God is encouraging Samuel. And he says in verse 7, The Lord said, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, they have rejected me. And we can remember that uh, as well. Uh, he says, Samuel, don't take it personally. Uh, they're rejecting me. And when we take the gospel to people or we try to uh, encourage someone, maybe they're falling into sin, and as the scripture says, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, and we try to go and restore them, and they may not respond. And they may turn us away. And so God says to us, as he did to Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They are rejecting me. And so now we see, after God gives Samuel the answer, now we see Samuel's reply, beginning in verse 10. Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that ask of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. And notice those words, he will take. In verse 11, he'll take your sons and appoint them for himself. Verse 12, he will appoint them captains over thousands. Verse 13, he will take your daughters. Number 14, he will take your fields. 15, he will take the tent of your seed. Verse 16, he will take of your men servants. Verse 17, he'll take the tent of your sheep. He's going to take, and he's going to take, and he's going to take. And, and so God says, Samuel, I want you to go to them, and I want you to give the people what they want. And what they want is not good for them. They thought it was going to be good for them. They wanted their own king to be like everyone else. And so God's going to let them have what they want. And so we need to make sure when we're praying to, for God to give us something that it's according to God's will. It's not just what we want, but it's what he wants. Because if we get what we want, sometimes we can deceive ourselves. And so here God says to Samuel, go back and give them this warning that this king is going to oppress you. He's going to oppress your families. He's going to take your possessions. You're going to work in the fields and it's going to go to him. And it's not going to be what you think it's going to be. Uh, the grass is not always greener on the other side, as we sometimes say. And so Samuel's going to go back and give this message uh, to them. And then verse 18, when he goes back and gives that to the message to the people, it says, And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you. Uh, and so you're going to come to realize that what you wanted was not good. But you've made your bed, now you're going to lie on it. You're going to cry out to God, and he is not going to hear you. He's not going to answer you. He's going to teach you a lesson because you have insisted to do your own will. Verse 20, he says that we may, 19, excuse me, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, nay, but we will have a king. There's our will. We will have a king. That's what we want. We demand it of you. We want to have our way. Verse 20, that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles there. And so we will. We're going to do it. They were stiff-hearted. They were stubborn, they were sinful, they were rebellious, and they had a plan that they thought was better than God's plan. And Satan will always try to get us discouraged and think there's something better for us than what God has. And God's plan is always good. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights, James tells us there. And so Samuel goes back. And the people say, nope, that's not what we want, Samuel. So verse 21, Samuel heard all the words of the people. And notice what he did. 
and. There's that conjunction again. He heard the words of the people and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, hearken unto their voice and make them a king. So Samuel's second prayer, uh, he goes back and he reports to the Lord what they've done and, and he goes and talks to the Lord. What a wonderful thing for us to do. Aren't you glad that we have a personal God? And, and Samuel went to him and prayed and God told him what to do and he goes to the people, then he comes back to God and, and he's talking to God back and forth. And that's what God wants from us. Uh, when things aren't going our way, when people are being stubborn and getting in our way, we can go to the Lord and we can rehearse these things in the ears of the Lord. Now God knew all of that. Samuel didn't need to tell God for, you know, to kind of, okay God, I'm going to keep you in the loop so that you know what's going on. God knew all of that. But when we go to God in prayer, we are showing our dependency on Him and also we are maintaining that fellowship uh, with Him. And so whenever he goes, we see his report back to God. And God said, here is your responsibility, Samuel. I want you to hearken to their voice there. And, and so God told Samuel to give them what they want. And they're going to regret it later. Uh, and so again, we be careful about what we ask for uh, there. Because we want to make sure it is in God's will. If we receive something and ask for something and get it, and it's in God's will, it's always going to be good for us. But whenever we're outside the will of God, that's when things are going to harm us there. And so now we come to chapter 9. And in chapter 9, we're going to look at three chapters tonight, 8, 9, and 10. Saul is introduced. He will be the first king. So in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechereth, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul. And so here we see something a little bit about Saul's father. He was a, he was a mighty man of, of power. Uh, and then we see some qualities of Saul that are mentioned uh, here uh, in this verse. First of all, it says he was a choice young man. Uh, and, and a choice young man, uh, he was young, and what we would say, you know, he's the valedictorian of his class. He's right at the top of his class. He is just uh, a very uh, sharp individual, and he's young. He has a bright future ahead of him. Uh, he is just top choice there, uh, select among all. And then he's very congenial. He says he's goodly uh, in uh, this verse 2. The word goodly means that he was in favor with God and man. He was very pleasing. Uh, he was easy to get along with. He was well liked uh, there. And so here's this big man, as you remember the story of Saul and how he was head and shoulders bigger than the others. And we use the term sometimes, a gentle giant. And so here he was, uh, a very goodly person. But then the next characteristic uh, we see uh, is down in verse 5. Uh, and before we get to verse 5, notice at the end of verse 2, it says, from his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. So the next tallest person would just come to his shoulders. So he was, and so... From a human standpoint, the people are going to look at him and say, yeah, that's the kind of king we want. You know, he's, he's big and strong, and he'll fight our battles for us. Well, verse 4 says, uh, excuse me, verse 3, the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, take one of the servants and go and seek the asses. So he sends his son on a mission to go and find these lost donkeys. And so he's going to go, and God is working all of this uh, because he's going to come in touch with Samuel, and Samuel's going to anoint him king, all because he is going looking for these donkeys that his father uh, has sent him out. And, and so in verse 4, it says he passed through Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha 
but they found them not. They passed through the land of Shalim, and they were not. And he passed through the land of Benjamites, and they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Zeph, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses, and they take thought of us. And so, uh, you know, as parents say, you know, when you get there, call me and let me know that you're there. I want to know how you're doing. And obviously they didn't have cell phones or even pay phones. He could stop by in the wilderness there and call home. But he was concerned for his parents. Uh, and so here is a man who's going to be king, and he has some really good qualities here. Uh, and God's going to give this king to them, and, and we'll see, as you well know, how he, he eventually failed there. But we should be, uh, you know, as maybe not the top of the class, but we ought to be choice uh, among God's people, and we ought to be congenial, we ought to be caring, and Saul was this kind of person. So we see his qualities, and now we see uh, his question in verse 6 and 7. He said to him, Behold, there's in this city a man of God. He's an honorable man, and all that he says comes to pass. Now let us go there, peradventure, he can show us our way that we should go. In other words, help us find these lost donkeys. Verse 7, and Saul said to the servant, Behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? Uh, and so we see another quality here. Uh, he's going to be faithful in giving. He's going to ask from the man of God to help him and show him where the donkeys are. But he's not going expecting something for nothing. He wants to take a gift. He wants to pay him for his service there. And so, verse 7, he says, What shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there's not a present to bring to the man of God. And the servant answered Saul. And as occasionally we see in the scripture, whenever God is using a servant, whether it was Abraham's servant going to get a bride for Isaac. Uh, oftentimes the name of the servant uh, is not uh, mentioned here, and this servant uh, is not uh, mentioned uh, as well. And so, but he's there, and we see as Saul goes to meet Samuel, we see first of all the servant. And then in verse 8, the servant answered Saul and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver that will I give and so here's a servant and he's helping out Saul and Saul's father Kish and he says I have a little and I'm willing to give what I have and isn't that what God wants of us a willingness to give what we have here was Saul wanting something to give he didn't have anything but God provided it right away through his servant there. And so they come to see Samuel, who was called the seer, uh, in verse 9. Uh, it tells us that before the prophet was called a prophet, he was called a seer, obviously because he could see into the future and tell uh, what the Lord was going to do uh, there. And Samuel was that prophet or the seer. And, and so they wanted to find him their purpose was to go and find the donkeys. But God had another plan for them. Uh, and whenever we are obedient, as he was to his father, and doing what his father had commanded, there's another plan that God has that he will work uh, as well. And so they come to Samuel, and we see the sacrifice. When he comes in verse 11, as they went, and you'll see that phrase several times through this passage, as they went, and God directs us as we go. As I said before, you can't steer a parked car. And so here they are, they're moving, going where God wants them to go. And they said, is the seer here? Verse 12, and they answered him, and they said, he is. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today. It just so happened that he came the same day you did. And we know, we look at that and and God is orchestrating this. There are no coincidences. 
uh, in the Christian's life. And this is not a coincidence that Saul gets there after he's been through all these other places and couldn't find them. He comes and here's Samuel uh, here. Verse 13, they said, And as soon as you come to the city, straightway you'll find him before you go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come and blesses the sacrifice. So they're not going to eat until they pray and bless the food uh, there. We shouldn't eat before we pray and ask God to bless the food uh, either there. And, and so we see this sacrifice in God's timing. Now look at verse 14. So they went up to the city, that is Saul and his servant, and when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out unto them for to go up to the high place now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came. God had whispered a little secret uh, to Samuel. Uh, and, and Samuel, uh, there's man coming, uh, verse 16. He whispered in Samuel's ear. Remember Samuel had this relationship with God. He had already gone to him twice and prayed with all of these things going on. And he talks to God and God talks to him. Isn't it wonderful we can do that? We can talk to God and read his word and he talks to us. So verse 16, God whispered in his ear. He said, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin. Now remember, this man was coming looking for his father's donkeys. But here God says to Samuel, I am sending him to you. Uh, and so God was sending him by causing those donkeys to be lost, he's using those circumstances to direct Saul and Samuel as well. And God does that with us as well. He says, I'll send you a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry is come unto me there. And so... The people had said, we want a king to be like everyone else. And God says, Samuel, give them what they want. And then later God says, Samuel, this is the one. Verse 17, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, there's that communication again, behold the man. Here he is, Samuel, that I spake to thee of. When I whispered in your ear, this is the man I was talking about. And so now we see their supper from verses 18 through 25. Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate, and he said, Tell me, I pray thee, where's the seer's house? Samuel said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, and you shall eat with me today. And tomorrow I will let thee go, and I will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And as for thine asses, verse 20, they were lost three days ago, said, set not your mind on them, they're found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on thy father's house? So Samuel says, Saul, don't worry about the donkeys because the desire of Israel is on you. And I know he must have been really glad that the donkeys were found and he could go home, but what does this mean? The desire of Israel is on me. So Saul answered him in verse 21 and said, am I not a Benjamite? I'm of the smallest of the tribes, and my family's the least of the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? We we'll see another quality. We saw a few qualities of Saul earlier. Now we see one of humility. And as we saw this morning, God uses little things. He used the little hand, the little cloud about the size of a hand uh, there, and he can use little things. And, and here's Saul who's little in his own sight, which is a wonderful quality that later he discards and becomes full of pride. Verse 22, Samuel took Saul and his servant and he brought them to the parlor. He made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about 30 persons. Samuel came to the cook, said, bring the portion that I gave thee of which I said to thee, set it by thee. The cook took up the shoulder and that which was upon it and he set it before Saul, and Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, 
I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And, and so here, uh, Saul's getting ready to be uh, anointed uh, as king, and he's eating with Samuel. Verse 25 says, And when they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. Just as Samuel had communed with God, now he's going to talk to Saul there. And as we come to the next point, Samuel is going to anoint Saul, beginning in verse 26 of chapter 9. It says, They arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day. Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel abroad. And as they were going, here it is again, as they were going, I mentioned it earlier in verse 11, uh, as they went, as they're going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But he says, But stand thou still a while, and I will show you the word of God. And here's the authority. He says, You ask why someone of the smallest tribe, the authority from God is given, and you are going to be anointed there and stand still and I will show you uh, the word of God. The people didn't want to hear the word of God. The people wanted to be like all the other nations. But now Samuel says, I will show you the word of God. And then we see when we get into chapter 10, the anointing of Saul. Verse 1, Samuel took a vial of oil he poured it upon his head, and oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. We see that in the tabernacle with the oil and the lamps uh, there and how they saturate the wicks and they continue to burn. Uh, there is not the wick that does the burning, but it's the oil that saturates. And, and so we could do a message on the oil and the Holy Spirit, but just make a note of that as we read this. And so Samuel took a vial of oil. He poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border. And so here's the seer. He sees what's going to happen in the future. And this is a little strange to me when I read what these three men he's going to find. Notice what he says. He says, you'll see three men and they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentst to find, lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses, he sorrows for you. What shall I do for my son? That was the concern that he had. Verse 3, Then thou shalt go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel. Uh, Bethel means house of God. And, and notice what these three men are carrying. It says, one of them is carrying three kids. He's carrying the three goats. Another one is carrying three loaves of bread. And another one's carrying a bottle of wine. <laughs> it seems like, you know, each one of them will carry a kid, you know. And, and so I guess the guy with the bottle of wine, maybe he had a disability or he was weak. I don't know. But anyway, uh, some things I just noticed in Scripture sometimes uh, there that doesn't really apply to us in any ways I can think of. But anyway, it's interesting. Verse 4, he says, These three men, they will salute you, and they will give thee two loaves of bread. And thou shalt receive of their hands. God provides for him. And after that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. Thou shalt come to pass, when thou art come there to the city, Thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. Notice the music involved here. They have all these instruments, and he is being anointed here uh, with these prophets there. And verse 6 says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. There And so as we look at this anointing, the Spirit of God comes on him and he's changed. Whenever a person comes to know the Lord, 
and has the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which is the Lord uh, filling us with his spirit uh, there, it, it makes a difference in our lives when we get saved. So verse 7, he says, And let it be, when these signs are come to thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to thee to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry. And we'll see that later in the story. So Samuel says, wait for me, and I'll come, and I will show you uh, what to do. And now he's been anointed there. And so now, number nine, Saul prophesies, and he returns home. Notice his change. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And so whenever the Holy Spirit of God comes on us, uh, and of course this is a different dispensation, but in the New Testament when a person gets saved, immediately the Holy Spirit comes to live within us and God gives us another heart. He makes us a new person. If any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, behold, he's a new creation. Old things passed away. All things become new. And here is Saul, a new person. Uh, and then verse 11, it came to pass, when all that knew him before time, they saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. And then the people said one to another, what is this that's come upon the son of Kish? He's changed. He's not what he used to be. And so we see this change that's come upon him, uh, and, and the people uh, notice there. His companions, they said one to another, what has happened uh, to Saul? They were surprised by the change, but they noticed the change. And whenever we get saved, there is always a noticeable change when the Lord anoints us with his Holy Spirit. And then we see, finishing up this chapter, Saul becomes king beginning in verse 17 uh, to the end of the chapter. Pick it up in uh, verse 17. Samuel called the people together to the Lord to Mizpah. He said to the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 19, And ye have this day rejected your God. Remember God said to Samuel, They haven't rejected you, they rejected me saying, set a king over us. Verse 20, and Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near. Uh, and as they're coming, it says in verse 21, Saul, the son of Kish, was taken, and when they sought him, he couldn't be found. Saul wasn't there. It's time to anoint him as king, and he's not there. And so he had hidden, verse 22. The Lord answered, behold, he had hid himself among the stuff. And they ran in verse 23, and they fetched Saul. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. And they look at this man and they say, wow, he is a mountain of a man. Samuel said in verse 24 to the people, see ye him whom the Lord hath chosen. So the selection of God uh, was... Saul, God chose him, and God had already told the people, you're not going to like what he does. Oh, he might be pleasing and kind and caring for his parents now, but this position is going to go to his head, and, and you're going to regret it. And so God begins to provide in, in verse 26. Saul went home to Gib Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. And God is putting this man in a position and God is going to give him a support group of people to help him in the position that God has given to him. And, and, and of course I see that in our ministry here with God placing me here uh, as pastor. And I look at the band of men and women here in our church and our school people whose hearts God has touched and they're there as support being a supply from God. But what do you think is going to happen whenever God begins to work, 
God has selected a leader. God has put together a band of men whose hearts God has touched, and they all lived happily ever after, is what the fairy tale says. But no, verse 27, but the children of Belial. Remember we saw that a few Sunday nights ago, uh, which is a reference to uh, Satan. The uh, sons of Eli were sons of Belial. Uh, and so whenever God is working, you can mark it down. Satan's going to work hard. He's going to do everything he can to destroy God's plan, to destroy God's people, to destroy the hearts of those whose God, hearts God has touched there. And so anytime God works and provides, Satan and his crowd. It doesn't say Satan here. It says the children of Belial. And just as God uses us as he used his band of men, Satan has his crowd that he wants to use too. And God, Satan will use people to discourage you. He will use people to disappoint you. He'll use people to defeat you. And he will do everything he can to try to keep you from going in God's plan there. And we will struggle with those things, but... Remember, we've been anointed with the Holy Spirit of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so we don't have to give in to those struggles. And notice his response, Saul's response. These people, they despised him. And they didn't bring him presents. That was customary for the kings that would bring them presents there. But they didn't. They didn't like him. And what did he do? He held his peace. In other words, he pretended to be deaf, the silence of Saul. And that's a good practice, isn't it? Whenever we see children of Belial, as they're called, coming after us, and it looks like God's plan is going to be stopped, and we don't know what to do, maybe we just ought to hold our peace. And God is the one who sent Saul, when he thought he was going, just looking for donkeys to be anointed. And God worked it out that same day for Saul and Samuel to be there. And God will work this children of Belial stuff out too. If we will just hold our peace and look to God, he has a plan. He had a plan for the nation of Israel. He had a plan for Samuel, a plan for Saul. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. And we can hold our peace and let the Lord fulfill his plan. And so, the account, oh, well, that's not supposed to be there. Uh... That was from last week, wasn't it? That's a bonus. <laughs> there. I thought I had a, a conclusion there for you at the end. Uh, King Saul, he failed because of pride and self-confidence. Later we'll see uh, that. He was humble before. He says, I'm from the little tribe of Benjamin, the least there. And the humility that he once had, uh, pride goeth before a fall, a haughty spirit there. And remember the, the king who's coming next? David. He was known as a man after God's own heart. Saul was known, though these words are not in scripture, Saul was known as a man after Saul's own heart. And so if we are a man after my own heart with my selfish desires, as we saw this morning, we'll be defeated. But if we are after God's own heart, and allow God to lead us, and don't get ahead of God, uh, he'll work out those plans and the details, even when the opposition from the children of Belial come, we can commit it to the Lord, hold our peace, and the Lord will take care of it for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these many lessons we learned from Samuel and Saul tonight, and the children of Israel. What we really learn is your hand at work through these people. And you are the same God today that you were then, that you never change. And Lord, sometimes we can go about in life and it may seem like all I'm doing is hunting for lost donkeys. But you have a purpose in everything that we're doing whenever we follow your plan. And you will provide, even as you provided the gift for Saul to give to Samuel through his servant, you always provide Help us to be faithful. Help us to hold our peace. Help us to look and see your hand at work in our lives, even as you were working here in the nation of Israel. For it's in Christ's name we pray.
Amen. Would you stand together as we sing a hymn of invitation? Uh, Child of the King, 450. Would you stand together? That one or this one? 450? Is that the right one? Okay. 450. Would you stand, please? <laughs> Thank the Lord that we are his children, he is king, and he owns it all, and we can trust him. Hope to see you Wednesday night. We continue our study in the book of James. Uh, be in prayer for Brother Ray. He's a little bit weaker today. I'm glad he was able to be here uh, this morning. Uh, pray that he'll get his strength back, and the Cannons will be traveling back from Wyoming this week. Uh, so pray for their safety as they come back. The Merritts are traveling up to Canada uh, later in the week and pray for them as they travel as well. Steve, will you come and dismiss us in prayer? Our Father, it's wonderful to be in thy house, to hear thy word. And Father, I just thank you for a pastor who, who brings the word to us each week. Father, I pray that you would keep us all safe and be with those who are traveling. And Father, give us a good week and help us to witness to other people. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.